All right, guys, we are driving in the city of New River, Arizona, and we're driving down a pretty narrow road on the way to the Tonto National Forest, and we are gonna check out some amazing Indian ruins. At the top of a bluff, there's gonna be a great view, so I think we will all enjoy it. All right, guys, this is the trailhead here. Just gonna go right through this gate, and this is a beautiful area. Beautiful area. Nice saguaros forests of cholla cactus and uh yeah we're also parked next to an Indonesian, so that's fun anywho there's just one other person parked here and we're gonna be on our way remember smoky says to prevent wildfires gosh it's such a beautiful day today i'm so happy to be down here i've worked for the past seven days in a row and I just needed some sun and warmth. And right now it is a beautiful, like 60 degrees and sunny, a big blue sky in the Sonoran Desert. And it's fantastic. Out of any desert you could think of, the Sonoran Desert is probably the most lush jungle of vegetation, um, you know, for a desert. Um, it's spectacular. It's crazy how diverse, how, oh my God, I just... This is what you got to watch out for. Holy shit. <laughs> Come on now. All right, not going in there. Just got to watch my step. <laughs> in the uh, the hanging cane choya forest, that's how they propagate. They drop their little babies and you step on them and carry them places, but you also hurt yourself. So anyways, I was saying the Sonoran Desert is a lush subtropical jungle and there is an amazing variety of interesting vegetation including um, the saguaro cactus you will only find the saguaro cactus in the sonoran desert and that's the big typical um stereotypical cactus you think of when you think of the american southwest so we're gonna make our way along this road you could probably drive in this road if you had a four-wheeler or a jeep or something like that it's way too rough for me to drive on so um we're gonna be walking along and it'll be great Clearly the erosive action of water has left its mark here. So the trail to this set of ruins is only about two or two and a half miles long. So it'll be maybe around five miles round trip longer with all the detours I take, but it's a really accessible, really accessible set of ruins, and they're not that far from Phoenix. So, if you ever need to escape the uh, apocalyptic place that is Phoenix, at least some of the places of Phoenix that I've seen, um, you can head out here. You know, some of Phoenix is nice. If you're extremely wealthy and you live in Scottsdale or something, or really anywhere, it's just so expensive there now. If you can afford it, you can find some nice places for sure. But it's not the affordable place it once was. That's for sure. So the teddy bear choya is another type of choya, and they're actually even worse than, than the other choya. We were, oh my goodness, look at this. Already got a little piece on me. They drop these little arms and legs on the ground like that, and they're even more spiny. But they even... They look cuddly, right? They look soft. No, no, they're evil. They're out to get you. So the teddy bear choy is another variety of choy that you'll find out here in the Sonoran Desert. They're very common. And they are brutal. People might wonder why I wear Crocs all the time. Probably like, oh, those are shitty shoes. What are you doing? You're out here. You could step on a cactus and this and that. Well, let me tell you something. Your ancestors walked around barefoot. Crocs with socks are all the protection I need, okay? They're already, they're already a lot. <laughs> so, and they're comfortable and they're versatile, I think. So, that's why I wear them. You don't have to wear Crocs if you don't want to. But I think they're great. People might consider them recession shoes, like from the last, not the last recession, but two recessions ago, the bad one. That's when they first became popular. <laughs> They stuck with me long after that, so <laughs> I like them. 
So if we look at the scenery around here, we see those um, distant mountainous features, you know, but there is one pinnacle right here. And it is the top of that that is where we're headed. And that is where the set of ruins that we're interested in are located. So it's pretty flat walking to get there. But once you get to the base of that pinnacle, you got to climb basically straight up. So another incredibly common drought resistant shrub is the Palo Verde. Some people consider it a tree in Phoenix. They'll prune it to be shaped like a tree. But it's a shrub out here or a bush, a big bush out here in the Sonoran Desert. You don't see leaves on it, but it doesn't want to waste its um, moisture on leaves um, because leaves transpirate, I guess, right? They lose moisture really quickly to the atmosphere because they have a broad surface area. So what it does, since it doesn't use leaves, is it has chlorophyll in its stems, in its branches, that can do the process of photosynthesis in the absence of leaves. That's why that Palo Verde is called Palo Verde because uh, in Spanish, that is uh, the green stick, right? Verde, green, pal pal palo is like stick, something like that. So anyways, Palo Verde doesn't have leaves. It doesn't need leaves. It's green trunks, green stems, green branches. It does all the photosynthesis it needs, and it is incredibly common around here. Look at this. This long race track, probably for a desert tortoise to race a desert hare. Am I right? No, this is much too short. The hare would easily win. It's got to be longer for the tortoise to win. Anyways, here's a very large Palo Verde. Another common plan out here is... The mesquite, there's many types of mesquite, but they have leaves, they look like this, and they have bark on their trunks. So their trunks and stems and branches, they're not green like the Palo Verde. But the mesquite is something you might know of because uh, the wood is used commonly in smoking or barbecue, stuff like that, am I right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but mesquite is a pretty popular flavor. And here's another very large Palo Verde. Evidence of big, nice fire. Ooh, I just saw a little lizard. This is a beautiful rock. It looks metamorphic, doesn't it? Because of the banding structure. This area is just littered with beautiful little rocks. Great variety, by the way. It's also littered with choya. Arms and legs, look at that. Under the underneath them, got to really watch your step. I bet you something's living in that hole. It's a hole right there. Something's living in as well, probably. So in the desert, plenty of animals live underground to escape the heat, and you know anything from. Is it kangaroo rats or kangaroo mice, rodents, things like that, to snakes, to, you know, basically everything. Because not much can handle this place in the summertime. You'd fry yourself to death. All right, I might as well show you guys another desert plant common here in the Sonoran Desert and in other deserts uh, like the Mojave. It's the creosote bush. Smell it, rub it, rub the leaves between your fingers. They're little waxy leaves. Smell it, it smells great. People use this as soap, apparently, if they don't have it. And if you're in the middle of the desert, because it makes you smell good, we could use it as deodorant. People say it smells like desert rain, but here's why that's wrong. Yes, it smells like the smell you smell when it's raining in the desert, but that's not because you're smelling the rain. It's because you're really smelling this plant, and it becomes very fragrant when it hits water and it gets... Um, you know, all juiced up like that. So you're really just smelling the creosote bush when it rains. So the creosote bush doesn't smell like desert rain. Desert rain smells like the creosote bush. Now you know. We are making slow and steady progress. As is usual, you know, I don't want to get all burned out by rushing. Have all day. 
and it's a beautiful day. Big blue sky. So I'll enjoy my time out here and soak up that vitamin D. By the way, you need vitamin D. If you're not taking vitamin D, I hope you're getting enough strong UVB radiation. Because if you're not getting the adequate amount of UVB radiation from the sun, you're not getting enough vitamin D. Because that's about the only place you can get vitamin D. And you should be taking a supplement if you're not, if that's the case. Because vitamin D is an incredibly important hormone that not only regulates your mood, improves all sorts of brain function, but it's so important for immune system health. I don't know if you know this, but one thing that most people who um, get bad cases of COVID have in common, outside of whatever comorbidity it might be, you know, heart disease and diabetes, things like that, it's that they're vitamin D deficient. Vitamin D is so important for your immune health. It's important for lots of different diseases. Um, you just got to do some research on it because it seriously is so important and it's the one vitamin that most people are deficient in. This is a nice prickly pear right here, little guy. Here's another choya. This is a different type of choya. But to tell you the truth, a lot of these choya interbreed and hybridize, so it's kind of hard to distinguish between them sometimes. But anyways, you really should be taking vitamin D. Here's your public service announcement for that. There's a nice big saguaro, giant saguaro. So go get it. Go get some vitamin D. You got to take it if you're not getting enough sun. By the way, the darker your skin is, the longer time you need, to need in the sun to process the same amount of vitamin D. Because the more melanin you have, the less efficient your body is to process the vitamin D or to produce the vitamin D maybe. Yeah, because vitamin D is produced in your skin. So yeah, if you're, you know, if you're very pale, you probably only need 15 minutes of pretty good UV exposure, but darker you are, you need more. That's just how it works. It's just an evolutionary trait. So there you go. Got some nice saguaros here. So by the way, we are in the Tonto National Forest. This is not the traditional national forest that you might think of when you think of a national forest. You're thinking, what? where's the trees? Well, this is about as lush as we'll get for the Sonoran Desert. Um, we've got forests of saguaros and forests of Palo Verde and forests of Choya. So, you know, national forest is just a public land management designation. It doesn't mean you actually need pine trees or hardwood trees, things like that. But this is the Tonto National Forest, one of the largest national forests in the country. Millions of acres of public land for you to enjoy. There's some very tall saguaro. There's our target. Now isn't this just absolutely beautiful right here? Got another good grove of choya. And we got a big saguaro. We've got the road. Still a lot of mud here, residual from the last time it rained. You know, the Phoenix area picked up basically record-setting amounts of rain. I think last week they made their daily record. They had the wettest first four days of December on record, or since 18-something, whatever. So, yeah, very wet. Some parts of the desert south of Phoenix have come out of short-term drought, actually, so... Look at this though, you better be ready. If you're gonna drive this road, I mean, look at that. <laughs> and these are deep, deep, deep ruts now from the uh, mud that was here. This little bush is very fragrant. They leaf out after it rains for the season and they're just beautiful, beautiful, fleshy, not succulent, but uh, I don't know how to describe them, like soft, nice, nice, malleable leaves. They're great. And if you're ever wondering what the skeleton, what the inside of a, of a cane choya looks like, they look like this. I think they were actually traditionally used to make things, those skeletons. It's a great view. Great view. 
The saguaros actually like to use the Palo Verde as like a nursery tree, if that makes sense. They like to take root when they're little babies right underneath the Palo Verde. Oh, I just saw a coyote. Just saw a coyote run away. I feel like the desert is one of the only places where you'll see coyotes running around in the daytime. At least that's the only place I've seen them running around in the daytime. Usually, um, you know, back east, they'll come out in the evening or at night. Unless they're rabid. But anyways, yeah, the saguaro takes root. I think at some point maybe it kills the, the Palo Verde tree, but it really is a symbiotic relationship or a dependent relationship at first, not necessarily mutually beneficial. Here's another great example of a saguaro growing inside Palo Verde and a great sampling of classic Sonoran desert vegetation. Here's a big spread of prickly pear. No fruits right now, but nice flat pads and an old saguaro. You know, it takes about 80 to 100 years for a saguaro to even grow one arm. So that gives you an idea of how old these plants are out here. And old saguaros are great habitat for birds, things that like to burrow inside their, their skeletons. This is just such a grand landscape that we're walking in on. Great views and there's a pretty broad desert wash down there so you get water flowing down when it rains. Dropping some elevation right now as we head toward the wash. This is just an amazing view. This would be fun to drive down. There's actually some pretty decent regeneration of saguaro out here. I know that's a problem in other parts of the Sonoran Desert. Horses have been through here. Water runs through here, you can tell. But anyways, um, like I know in the Saguaro National Park by Tucson, they have some issues with saguaro regeneration. So at this point, there's quite a few junctions. What we're gonna do is we're not gonna cross that little desert wash. We take a left here, head uphill, and if it looks rocky and steep, if it goes uphill, that's the path you wanna take because we wanna get to that butte. I have to say guys, this trail would be hell. It would feel like hell, the burning pits of hell. It'd be so fucking hot out here in the summertime. So don't come here in the summertime unless you like like not just pain, but you like death because that's what it'll be unless you're super acclimated to this somehow. This part of the country averages high temperatures well over 100 degrees for multiple months out of the year. So it gets hot here, very hot. The only time you'll find relief in the summertime is maybe at night. And also if you get a monsoon thunderstorm rolling through, that'll help cool you off because you'll be wet. But beyond that, it's hot, hot, hot. On top of that, without shade and with the sun this far south, the UV index will be 10, 11, 12. That's pretty extreme. You're going to get sunburnt unless you're pretty dark if you're out in the sun for a long period at all. So I'm taking a left at this junction to continue going uphill. I 
I was wrong. Do not take a left at this junction. Do not follow this this uh, trail that says 53. We want to go straight for now. We're going to climb uphill on the back side, on the north side of the butte. So we're going to go straight and keep going for now. Okay, we are gaining a good amount of elevation now. You can see the path that we are on, where it goes. It's right along kind of like the north, northeast side, um, the northeast spine of this uh, topographical feature. So we pick up some great views. I'm sure the view from the top will be great. Um, I'm getting to see some Ocotillo here. Ocotillo is another desert plant. It's the spindly plant. It only leaves out after it rains. We are climbing. This is a pretty high grade. So, and we're getting some great views of the saguaro cactus here. This is a tall one. Tall boy, tall skinny boy. Oop, and you gotta watch out for this. Watch out. Anyways, cool. There's actually a breeze up here. There's a breeze as you get higher here, which is very, very nice because it already feels hot. It's only 60 degrees and the sun angle is low and this is the coldest time of year and it is hot for me. So, yeah, like I said, if you came here in the summertime, you'd kill over, die, your head would end up on a tortoise like it's breaking bad. You know, it wouldn't be pretty. Here's another example of Ocotillo. Somebody on a dirt bike coming, actually. Impressive, he came up here. Looked so easy for him. Meanwhile, I'm using my legs. <laughs> yeah, we're getting. This is literally a. This is like a 30 degree to 45 degree incline. No joke. walking the rest of the way. Yeah, that was steep. Look at that. This Ocotillo is, uh, it's been a long time since it's leafed out, but you can see that it turns red toward the end of its little life cycle. Kind of get some nice fall foliage there. Okay, so I just took a bathroom break on this little knoll. Now we're gonna cross this little saddle here. That's where uh, that guy parked his dirt bike. Then we're gonna make the final ascent up the, up the butte. <laughs> All right, here's a great way to see Choya regeneration. Okay, so they drop their little little bits, right? After they fall on the ground, they take root and you get more Choya plants growing like this. This will be really steep up here. This part of the trail is much narrower. It's basically just bedrock here.
Thank you.